Festival Book Club. Happy Halloween. We are talking tonight about one of my favourite books, The Haunting of Hill House. I am Danny Robbins. Um, before we start, I've got to remind you about a few little things I've been told. One is that Hay Festival is a charity with year-round activities to connect audiences with artists. So thank you to everyone for their continued support and engagement. Thank you to all of you for joining with us. Uh, also, The Haunting of Hill House, the book we're talking about tonight is the Hay Festival Book Club pick for October. Copies are available for purchase on the Hay Festival website, or you can buy a copy from your local bookseller. Go, go into an actual bookshop, don't go to an evil uh, internet empire. Uh, Hay Festival Book Club is supported by Unwin Charitable Trust, and you can find past events uh, like these available to rewatch free online now. Our November selection will be small things like these by Claire Regan. Much more information on the Hate Festival website. But I am joined for tonight's discussion by author Elizabeth Hand and journalist Ida Edamariam. Um, here they are. Liz, I know, is joining us from Maine and Ida from Oxford. Uh, I am from sunny Wolfenstow, where it is a proper autumnal night, perfect for talking about a ghost story. Um, just a little bit of background about both of our guests tonight, our, our, our speakers tonight. Elizabeth is the author of 20 plus cross genre novels and five collections of short fiction. Her work has very appropriately received the Shirley Jackson Award three times and the World Fantasy Award four times. Lots of awards, loads of other awards as well. Um, she's a longtime critic and contributor of essays for the Washington Post, the Los Angeles Times, Salon, Boston Review and the Village Voice, and she divides her time between Maine and North London. Uh, her latest book is A Haunting on the Hill, a sequel to the Haunting of Hill House. So we'll talk a lot more about that later on. Um, Ida is a writer and editor. She's worked as a journalist in New York for Harper's Magazine and in Toronto and London, where she's senior feature writer and editor for The Guardian. Um, she's been a judge for the International Booker Prize. And her first book, The Wife's Tale, was named as a finalist for the prestigious Governor General's Award for Nonfiction in Canada. And she has written in the past on Shirley Jackson's work. So both supremely qualified to talk about this book tonight. For anyone not familiar with me, I am the host of the BBC podcast, The Battersea Poltergeist, The Witch Farm and Uncanny, all based on real life ghost stories. And Uncanny has become a BBC TV series as well. Um, I also wrote the play 222, A Ghost Story, which has been on in the West End here in the UK and internationally. So hopefully I can uh, claim some ghost credentials tonight as well to talk about this haunted house story. So, um, Wow, there's so much to talk about. I I, I want to say up front, I, I love this book enormously. I, I, I know that both of you do too. Um, Elizabeth, I'm going to come to you first. And I, and I want to sort of kick off by saying that I think a lot of the great ghost stories have been short ones. If we think of the likes of M.R. James or Sheridan Le Fanu, Charles Dickens. And I think one of the reasons for that is once you have met your ghost, things get rapidly less scary. And I think the genius of this book, I would claim, is that you never really meet the ghost. In fact, we're not even quite sure if there is one. And um, it sort of chimes with something I feel that, that the thing that scares human beings most is uncertainty. I would say this is a masterclass in uncertainty. What would you make of that, Liz? Absolutely. I, I agree completely. Um, as a matter of fact, when I was researching a haunting on the hill. I was researching, you know, ha haunted houses and supposedly haunted houses. And there are, have actually been studies of this by psychologists and sociologists. And what they found was if somebody is confronted in real life, um, but as in literature, with a house and goes into it, what is frightening about it is that uncertainty. If you were, If you look at a house and it's completely falling down derelict in flames or something, unless you're a fireman, fire person, you're probably not going to enter it. But if it's really, if it's dilapidated and, and perhaps creepy, but you're not really sure, maybe somebody lives there, maybe it's being renovated, but you go in and then you are confronted with sounds or shadows or whatever, it is that uncertainty. Um, so it's something that we actually carry from real world encounters with houses or domiciles, um, as well as the ones in literature. And I think that is that sort of equipoise is, is what really keeps us not just off, off balance, but also just, you know, really compels us to keep reading or to keep walking if we're in 
the house in real life. <laughs> Interesting. I think, you know, we deal very badly with doubt as human beings. You know, once you know what the monster is, you can face it, you can prepare to face it. And I think she plays with us brilliantly, Shirley Jackson, in, in never quite knowing what the one, what the monster is. You know, we never quite meet that monster, do we? No, no. Uh, and um, I'm sure I want to hear what Ida thinks. Um, we, we don't even know if it's in Eleanor's imagination. There are scenes in the book that seem as though they are told from a, a third por person uh, point of view that would leave no doubt. But in fact, there is this sort of wiggle room in there. So is this all Eleanor? Is there actually uh, a haunting? Is the edifice, you know, Shirley Jackson's the, the famous intro and outro suggests that the house itself is, is a, a malevolent force. So yeah, totally, totally, totally. I mean, I, I, we'll talk much more about Eleanor in a minute. I, I, I'd, uh... What I was going to ask you was, there's been quite a few screed adaptations of this. There's a recent Netflix series, which is called The Haunting of Hill House, but it's it's a very loose adaptation. But a lot of people will have come to the book through that, potentially. Then there's two films. There's the 1963 one by Robert Wise, and then there's the 1999 version by Jan de Bont. And that version is absolutely terrible. I don't know how many people uh, <laughs> watching this tonight have seen it. it. It's an awful movie, and it's awful because it, it shows you the ghosts. You know, we've just been talking about that uncertainty. It shows you the ghosts via CGI. It was that era of um, the Phantom Menace when CGI kind of ran riot through films. But the 1963 one, you know, if people haven't watched it, they must. It's one of the best horror films I've ever seen. And it, and it kind of reminds me that in that movie, very little happens. You know, it, it's it's about sound effects and it's about people, frightened people. And it reminded me that this is a character study, really, isn't it? This is this is um, a, a, you know, a study of people and people under pressure. I, I mean, I, it's funny. I sort of go back to, to what you just said, but also back to what um, Liz said. Um, I I read it when I read the book. It was like it's all about character. It's all about point of view. It's fascinating if you follow the point of view through. I mean, the idea that you might like actually see the ghost, I think, yeah, it ruins it. It makes it completely, um, it, making it concrete is is to kind of um, take away what's, what's actually the most potent part about it. And yeah, I was looking at the kind of, um, I started, I actually started tracking the point of view. I sort of, I, <laughs> kind of you know because the packet the point of view starts it starts very distant um and the house is going you know it's, it's almost a sort of bird's eye view and then and everybody is described and then suddenly the reader comes quite close and suddenly is very close to Eleanor um but and 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 then it becomes and and there's the kind of but there's always a gap and the gap changes so the gap is either the author or the, the author being quite far being far away and then um but then and then it's whether she we're sort of so close to her the gap is between her and the other characters and i think it as a it's a fascinating character study it's all about it. it's so much of it you know it happens actually yeah you know, very much in the sort of re reader's head um or the viewer's head but it's about that i think but I think that unreliable narrator device works so well in horror because actually, potentially, the more scary thing is not that it's a ghost, but it's in your mind, you know, that you are going mad. That's, you know, potentially terrifying. And I think, you know, that that's absolutely kind of at the heart of, of Eleanor's character that we, you know, can we trust her vision? We've got a question actually from a uh, one of the people watching um, about this, Kelly, who says, um, whose hand was she holding? Talking about that scene where... <laughs> Where you know she, she believes she's holding Theo's hand and and then realizes she probably isn't. Um, and she says, or oh, to broaden the question, at the dark heart of this book is Eleanor haunted or hallucinating, or are they the same thing? I'll, I'll throw that to both of you, uh, haunted or hallucinating. Liz first. Well, I, I don't think she's hallucinating. I think, um, I, as I was mentioning earlier, I think that Hill House itself is a, a you know a malefic edifice. And I think it preys on people's um, weaknesses. It, it preys on their flaw, flaws. And, and Shirley Jackson does that brilliantly in her novel. Um, and I tried to jump off on that in mind that, you know, she, this is what you do. And I think that that is what, um, it's almost like the house is gaslighting her, you know, and at the very end when she, well, 
spoiler alert for anybody who hasn't read the book at the very end, you know, there's this, that line where she's, where Eleanor says, what, uh, wait, what am I, what am I doing? Why am I doing this? You know, it, it's like, she's come to her senses. Um, but, and she's prime. She is a, a prime, you know, victim, if we want to call her that for Hill house to prey upon, but there are enough references to other things. There's that very creepy scene where both she and Dora, I believe, I know she definitely, uh, Eleanor definitely has this vision. And it's kind of a, you know, as described, it's kind of a luminous vision of, of a picnic of people in, in period clothes from a different period from when the book is set. And they see it there. And El I think it's Eleanor screams, run, run. And they run away in terror. Um, so I think that they are not, Maybe you could say that Eleanor is imagining that or hallucinating that, but I personally don't feel that she is or was. I, I think that um, she was preyed upon by the house. I feel that's a really interesting question because it does feel like tangibly things are happening to other people as well. But, I mean, do you think, Ida, that there is a reading of this book where it is all in Eleanor's mind? I do. Um, I, 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 yeah, as I, I sort of pause because, as I say, I can think of all sorts of reasons why you can argue the opposite. Because she doesn't, she does sort of hedge her bets a bit, <laughs> um, you know, by sort of, you know, the house was vile. You know, there's a kind of, and then, and you know, there's a kind of the way in which it's built and the way. Um, I mean, this is a sort of slightly side issue, but I was fascinated in it is a horror as sort of you know interior design problem. But you know, there's a kind of... <laughs> <Don't play>. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But um, I think I do think I, I I think I think there's huge amounts of it. I mean the 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 passing of danger between particularly the two women is so well done. The kind of the kind of openness and vulnerability, and then the sort of increasing danger, which a lot of it comes from Theodora, you know, where where she where the sort of you you allow yourself to be vulnerable and then, you know, being laughed at, being betrayed, being, and then it becomes increasingly unstable. I, like, I just, I think it's a fascinating. Yeah. Um, it, it's, it's got the quality of a, a kind of, um, you know, a, a detective story, a kind of locked room mystery, where, you know, kind of people hold up in a country house and you, you've got your cast of suspects there and you're never quite sure of the motivations in, in, and, you know, if they are, kind of um, allies or, or enemies to Nell. Um, let's talk about Dr. Montague a little bit. I, I think, you know, I, I feel a particular affinity for him, I think, because, uh, you know, I, I've sort of styled myself as a ghost hunter and he absolutely is as well. I, I think it, he sets the mould, I would say, for a lot of subsequent ghost hunters and, and ghost hunting characters in you know, in literature and in film. He's someone who quotes paranormal history a lot. He talks about famous cases like Borley Rectory and, and Belekin House. And Liz, I, I just wondered, was Shirley Jackson herself an avid student of the paranormal? Did this book come out of a, a personal passion for the subject? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I think she, from what I know of, of her having read uh, several biographies and her letters and also having spoken with her, um, her family, you know, uh, uh, and, and having uh, met some of them over, over the years, I I believe that she was. I she had an interest in it. I, whether or not she was an avid believer, I don't know. You know, but I think she certainly had a fascination with it, and she had a, quite an extensive collection at their house in North Bennington of um, books related to the occult. She had quite a substantial library, I, I believe, of hundreds of books relating to that, um, witches and occult occurrences and other things. She was really fascinated by them. Um, and they, you know, and they fed not in just into this uh, work, but into other ones as well, where there's these sort of kind of flickers out of the corner of your eye of, of the occult or, or the other, um, however you want to call it, um, strange stories. I mean, in some ways she's not, especially when you read her other books, she's not unlike Robert Aikman and that it, her work is so grounded in our world, or I mean, contemporary 20th century slash 21st century world, that when the supernatural element, if that is what it is, and I, I agree with Ida, I think that you can be on the fence about it. Um, there is the matter of the rocks falling on the house <laughs> when Eleanor was a child. There is that. Other people saw that. So I don't know what was going on there. Um 
But Jackson herself, did, yes, she did have a long time. If I don't know if she had a lifelong, but certainly as as an adult, had a long time fascination with this, and it comes through in in you know certainly in, in the Hill House, but. Um, a bit in uh, We Have Always Lived in the Castle, which is, does not have a supernatural element, but you do have two people living in basically, you know, a haunted house, even though, they're, you know, it's what it's haunted by is by them and their memories of the family members who were murdered there. Um, so. I mean, I think it reads very authentically. I think it's very easy to write badly about this subject. I think, you know, there's a lot of stereotypes that people kind of um, go to very quickly when talking about the supernatural paranormal. But, it, you know, it, it reads as the work of somebody who's who's studied it and has a real affinity and and, and um, kind of love for the subject. And I, and I think, yeah, I mean, it'd be really interesting to know whether she was a, a sceptic or a believer. I, I think, you know, you, you can be equally fascinated by the subject wherever you come from, really. Um I mean, another one of the characters in, in the book clearly is the house itself. We sort of touched on this earlier and, and there's that lovely line, uh, you know, that some houses are born bad. And, and Ida, you mentioned that <laughs> Eleanor describes it as vile. Um, a, a lot of the book is described, is, is devoted to describing it. And I, I, I kind of I was thinking about this uh, on my way back from work on the train today coming here and, and just thinking about how it's it's virtual reality writing. It's writing that places you in that location really makes you feeling uh, makes you feel like you're experiencing it firsthand. You know, it's it's just so evocative, isn't it, Ida? Yeah, no, it's brilliant. It's brilliant. It's kind of um, I mean, the writing is brilliant generally, but the, the her interest in 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 just exactly what makes it feel slightly wrong. You know, the kind of the, the slightly crooked walls and slightly wrongly weighted you know and that is absolutely I mean you mentioned right at the beginning Liz about about our unease and our un like it doesn't add up in a very basic way and there's a kind you know there's everything is in slightly the wrong place the angles are in slightly the wrong place she's really she's brilliant on like you know upholstery like you know you know the upholstery yeah. like, that's that's that seems soft, but is actually hard and slippy, and you can't actually sit on it. You know, like the the in the sort of parlor where they gather, and and you know how that's you know that sort of joke about um, it being a you know mother you know a motherly embrace, which but you know which is obviously incredibly double edged. Um, but yeah, the sort of concreteness of 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 space, and there's a kind of she wrote a letter, I think. Because um, she had that, you know, she it, near the end of her life, she had that terrible episode of agoraphobia, didn't she? Um, and she wrote about having written herself into the house. And you can mm. watch all these characters almost think themselves into the house and just, you know, well, particularly Eleanor, but just kind of as as they try and as they try and puzzle it out, they start not kind of adding up. In the same way, if that makes sense. I think it, it totally like makes being, sense. Yeah, it feels like it feels like they're being bombarded, doesn't it, Liz? I mean, it feels like everything is kind of at eleven. You know, everything, all, all the sounds, all the sights. You know, it, it's kind of Eleanor is slowly kind of being overwhelmed by this place. Yeah, and I I think, and it's very very interesting what you're saying, Ida, because when I was. Um, Shirley Jackson, uh, you know, she did towards the end of her life develop um, what we would probably say now is agoraphobia. But she, when I was reading, well, when I was getting ready to write um, A Haunting on the Hill, I was rereading The Haunting of Hill House for, I don't know what, time, you know, the eighth time or something. But I thought, well, this time I have to actually go through it very carefully because although I have, uh, you know, all of the characters in, in my book are original characters, there's some sort of shout outs to other characters in, in the original. So the one character who carries through from Shirley Jackson's book is the house. And I thought, I have to get the geography of this house right. So I read it taking notes and highlighting you know, where is a window? Where is a door? Where is this? Because I'm thinking there's somebody out there who's going to read this, my book, and they're going to be like, oh, no, that, that's like that closet wasn't there. It was over there, you know, or, or that hallway didn't lead there. It led there. So I um, I was doing this and I, I worked. I, I drew my own schematic of what I thought the two floor plans were. And I um, I wrote to uh, Lawrence, who's Jack, Shirley Jackson's youngest son and the executor. Who was, you know, was my main contact uh, for, with the family for the book, 
And I said, you know, by any chance, did, did your mother ever like have any blueprints or, you know, draw something? And he said, yeah, I have these four drawings. And, and one of them was actually uh, reprinted in Ruth Fla- Franklin's uh, biography of Jackson. So one, so one of them is in there. And, uh, and the other ones, I looked at them and I, and I did mostly get some things right. It was actually very confusing. So I'm like, all right, wait, where is the red room next to the green room or is it across the hall? But what was very strange to me and very unsettling, and I've, I've said this before, but it was really quite, it was very noticeable for me. I was very unsettled, especially after I looked at those, writing and having myself be in Hill House. It was a very disturbing place to occupy for the amount of time that I was writing that book. And looking at her drawings kind of unlocked some of that because I felt like I was looking into her mind, you know? And and actually the, the drawings are very, they're kind of rudimentary. They, they were not like, you know, a careful thing. They had everything there, but they were really sketched out in this certain way. And I felt like, oh my God, I'm, it's like it's like looking into her brain. It's like looking into her unconscious as she was working on this book. Um, so anyway, I really, I'm, I and I'm not, you know, superstitious really or anything like that. I, you know, I've had a few experiences, but but um, re, you know, inhabiting Hill House for as long as I did, I was I was actually quite relieved when the book was done and I could get out of there because I really did feel like I was living in that house and it was her house. It wasn't my house. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. <laughs> I was like, I, I was living in Charlie's house for a year, a year and a half. And it see, was, a, just, it was in a settling place. <laughs> There's so much I want to unpick here. Like, I mean, so she drew the pictures. Did, did she draw that as a way of kind of helping herself to get things right in the writing process? Did she want to make sure she knew her route around? I, I have to think she did. Um, mm. And I, I, I don't have the, I have the book, but it's on the shelf. Um, or <laughs> I'd hold it up. But anyway, I, yeah, I think she must have because it is confusing. It, it is confusing. And, and, you know, and some of it, like reading the book, there are, you know, there, there were points when I was like, this passage is not on her schematic. It's in her book. It's not marked there. So I think, you know, it was uh, it was bigger. It was bigger inside than out. There, there was more inside that house than was, you know, readily apparent, even from the, the drawings, the schematics that she herself came up with. But, yeah, I think she probably did have to do that to remember. What, I mean, I don't know. I. I, I, for the whole time I was writing that book, I, I would constantly have to go back and look at, look at her thing to see where the different rooms were. Um, and even then, when you know, it was in the process of being copy edited, I had a great copy editor. I said, "You've got to check this against her book," you know. And she would be like, "Yeah, that, that was the red room. That wasn't the the yellow room." And I was like, "Okay." She was, she was messing with me. <laughs> Also really interested by what you said about how you felt you went to a dark place whilst writing that. And I, I was reading um, Pet Cemetery by Stephen King the other day for the first time. And he talks in his introduction there about just what a dark place writing that book took him to, to the extent where he put it away for quite a long time. I think months, maybe even a, a year or so before he decided that it was right to publish it. But you know, even as a reader, I think, Ida, this, this book takes you to quite a disturbed and dark place. And, that, you know, there is a sense of relief when you get to the end of it not you know and yet a sort of sense of tragedy as well because of the way the book ends but it, it's um yeah i mean it, it's it, I, I think you know we touched on it earlier about that sort of sense of unease of uncertainty but uh, i think it's a book that makes you feel quite queasy as a reader throughout because of that yeah no i mean so I, you know i sort of put it you know i didn't read it all in one go and i didn't read it in the evening <laughs> mm. <laughs> <laughs> I, um, um in um I, you know, reread it this time, and then I. But when when I read it before, I meant I uh, made sure to read it in 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 daylight. Um, but I'm I'm quite um, you know, I'm easily. Um, but I think part of it is that she, her, her utter brilliance of bringing. It's like you come from this bird's eye view, and then suddenly, you know, maybe it is that moment of holding the hand where suddenly things start to slip, where you know, um, where you've. 
you come with the bird from the bird's eye and you and then you and then you're just there and then you're kind of like okay I'm in Eleanor's mind but I'm not sure whether she's the one who's fine and everybody else is being or whether they're kind of looking in you know like it it starts to be very because then you start to doubt yourself as well a little bit I think and I think that's a very very clever thing to pull off and very very well done yeah it, that, that focusing in takes a long time as well I I, I was looking back and I, I was really struck by the fact that the first thing you describe as tangibly paranormal phenomena is on page 127 of a book that's 246 pages it, it's a long slow build and you know I think I, I, it made me think of the exorcist actually you know which takes about yeah. an hour to get to the moment of possession but there's a definite argument I think that in horror that, that waiting makes the payoff so much more powerful you know it all yourself you don't they honestly you know like the waiting is is allowing that space for you to fill it you know it, mm. you know it's, it's what you said before like the, the minute they're concrete they you know it goes off in a, up, up in a yeah. but it's 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 a sort of yeah it's a control to just make more and more space for you to fill i think you know, it, it's interesting I, I think you know there's something about her writing style which makes you realize that you know very quickly you realize that she's a very skilled writer so you know you're in safe hands you know you can relax and from that point on on you you bloody can't relax because you know you know she's weaving out this tension and the fact that nothing is happening you know something's going to happen it's a haunted house story there's going to be something and so you get to this state of chronic tension by the time it kicks in um i i, I i'll throw this to both of you again because I, I don't know which one of you will will be um most sort of across this but um i'm intrigued to know we, we had a question from a uh one of our audience sim about whether this is based on a real event or potentially a real house or whether it's entirely fictional um do either of you know if she was drawing on a, a real place a real location or, or kind of real people real events i think there was a house that she saw and i can't recall now where it was um it it I think she describes it in one of her letters and she talks about it when she's talking about writing Hill House. It was just, it was a house she had seen somewhere and I believe it was in Vermont. It was not her house. And it was just um, an old, it was an old house that struck her with a sense of wrongness and uh she kind of filed that away in her head. Um, I'd have to go through her letters, but I'm 99% sure that I, I read, that's where I read about that, that she had seen a house, but from what she was describing in the letter and, and knowing that, because uh, I actually know the area of Vermont where she lived, because my, my parents had a place there and, and it was not a type of architecture that you saw in in Vermont or, or Northern New England. So when she created Hill House, she made that out of, you know, we well, don't make houses out of cloth, but she made that out of whole cloth. You know, she she came up with a different house than what than what one would typically see. Um, Hill House looks more like Stephen King's house in Bangor than it would look like kind of, um, you know, uh, local Northern New England architecture. Okay, no, inter interesting, fascinating, and uh, I mean, it, it kind of uh, it feels like you know certainly post Second World War there was that kind of boom of that that rise of interest in the supernatural as there was after the First World War as well. People kind of you know um, you know gr grieving people kind of reaching for you know that chance to contact the dead and, and a sort of rise of mediums and all sorts of things, and, and you know there'd been the kind of golden era of ghost hunting as well, kind of you know the thirties and forties. I, I just wonder, like, you know, in terms of the kind of cultural context for this book, you know, how how was it received in its day? You know, was it a hit in its day? And was it was it unusual as a haunted house novel or was it kind of one of many? You know, wh where did it sit culturally in its day? Um, Ida, did you want to weigh in? No, go ahead. Oh, uh, it, it, it was a, it was a very successful book. I, I mean, it was a bestseller. It did very well. Um, people knew, uh, you know, Jackson had a certain notoriety from the publication of The Lottery in The New Yorker some years before, which was really a, you know, a, a, a huge cultural event. People were very, 
distressed over that book. It was published in its entirety in an issue of the New Yorker and um, people wrote in outraged about it. And people also would write, you know, they would write to the New Yorker, they would write to Charlie Jackson and some people would write to her and say, where can I go to see this ritual in the lottery? So she was known uh, already. And then she had published, you know, a number of novels, but um, but the haunting of Hill House is, I, I believe, it, you know, it'd be analogous to what we would now call a breakout book. That, and then yeah. the Robert, Robert Weiss film, which uh, was done not too long thereafter, that kind of cemented her reputation and that novel's reputation as, as a classic of um, supernatural writing, haunted house literature. I kind of love the fact that she used her, um, well, she got something like, Sixty-four thousand something or other dollars for uh, you know when the movie rights were sold, um, and she used it on curtains and read, <laughs> like she used it on her house, like it was a kind Good. of. Like... <laughs> I, I I love it. That, that that yes, that makes me think of myself actually. Right when I wrote the um play two twenty two a ghost story, it's about a couple doing up their house, uh, kind of renovating their house. And I use some of the money from the play to renovate my own house. So it's uh, <laughs> that uh, definitely chimes with me. Um, but um, yeah, th this this question um, from an audience member kind of chimes with, with what we've just been talking about there. Um, Jen says, um, here's a great piece of literature that stands up with all the other classics, but it still feels like horror generally doesn't get the respect it should in the book world. Why? Why, Ida? Why is that? And is that true, I guess? Um, it's it's sort of a, it's partly a question about horror, I think, and it's partly a question about genre um more broadly. Um there's a kind of and I do think that this is changing a bit, that it's a lot more, but I and I think, you know, there was an actual I think it was a marketing decision a long time. I mean, and and and, and horror maybe is a little bit different, but you know, where's where's where there was a difference between genre and literary fiction, and it was a it was a proper decision to split the two as a sort of because uh, because for money making reasons, and then it was kind of you know, um, and and then literary fiction even might not made quite so much money, but it was taken more seriously to make up for it, kind of thing. I, there's a kind of there is a sort of um, very much more general um, answer to it. I don't know. Maybe there's a kind of it has such an extraordinary visceral effect that is so beyond. Um, maybe there's a kind of suspicion of that that people feel that they're being played in some way. Um, it's a cheap trick. Yeah, or sentiment yeah, okay. like the way that people dismiss sentimentality, or the way mm. that do you know what I mean? Um, yeah. I mean, you've only got to you know. You only got to read the first paragraph, and you know that you're, you know, in that, you know, you, that, that this person can write as well as anybody, um, and that every, you know, sentence to sentence, like the the the, the level of distillation and the level of um, wisdom and humor. Often, there's, you know, there's a huge amount of just really funny in in a sort of mm -hmm. in a very brilliant way, not in a cheap way at all, you know. Um, I, I, I mean, I, it's interesting. It's a really interesting question, I think, because I do think it's true. Like, you know, the, the, the you know, genre fiction in general is kind of marginalised, I think. And, you know, if you go into a bookshop, you'll find horror and science fiction together sort of hiding embarrassedly in the corner. You know, they're, they're kind of pushed right into the corner. And, um, uh, you know, I, I definitely had a sense when I, when I was before 222, a ghost story came out that, you know, I, I speaking to various people. I remember doing interviews with various critics and um and I could feel a real stiffiness a kind of like oh my god really a horror play are you sure and yet every time a good horror play comes out if you look at like Connor McPherson's The Weir or Ghost Stories The Woman in Black obviously which ran for you know decades you know people love it it's exhilarating and I think the same is true of a, a book like this it's a deeply exhilarating genre to read but um I, I don't I wonder sometimes if horror is an off-putting word Liz you know I think <laughs> horror movies certainly i think you know are a, a genre that uh, kind of appeals most to, to younger people i think and I, I mean i'm sort of using my wife and quite a few of our friends as a as a example here but i think a lot of people when they have kids kind of lose their threshold for this kind of thing they don't want to be exposed to shocks and scares and the kind of horrible dark side of life and i and i 
I think certainly what I do, I, I sometimes describe it as horror for people who think they don't like horror, you know, because I think, you know, you need to give people an entry point into this world that doesn't feel off-puttingly scary and 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 shocking and i think i think you know this book does that i mean i think it's a, a a deeply accessible book you could absolutely read this book if you felt you didn't like horror yes and and um i will echo what Ida was saying i think you know so much of genre literature has been stigmatized and marginalized for such a, such a long time i think it is changing actually i think there's uh, you know tanana reef do and um uh, Marina Enriquez, Kelly Link. There are so many writers out there now who are being who are considered literary writers as well as writers of of you know of horror and supernatural fiction. Um, but I think uh, you know I think that Stephen King had this uh, brief taxonomy of of you know horror writing uh, in his Danse Macabre, which was a study from the 1980s, a nonfiction book that was about, um, you know, a uh, history of horror and the supernatural. And he had, I'm trying to remember now, he said that there was, you know, there, there was terror, there was, you know, there was, un there was unease, there was terror, there was horror. And then he said the last resort was going for the gross out. And he said, I'll do all of the first three and I'm not above doing the last, the last one either. You know, I'll go for the gross out when, when, uh, when it's needed. Um, and I think it's that notion of going for the gross out. That's sort of the affect, affect horror, um, which has been written about. And you know, I think that is what can be off-putting for people. I mean, Robert Aikman called his collections of, of short fiction strange stories, and I always liked that as a designation. You know. Um, you know, Stephen King, I, I mean, earlier writers, there'd be tales of terror. There, I have, there's a classic American uh, anthology edited by Phil Phyllis Wise in, I think, the 1940s called Great Tales of Terror and the Supernatural. And it's not just American stories, it has stories from all over the world in it. But it was not horror in the supernatural, it was terror in the supernatural. I think horror as a, um, as a term... And I mean, I, you might know this because you're, you're, you know, more knowledgeable about this than I am. But I think it that as a term for, you know, relating to media, to literature, to film, I think that might have become more popularized perhaps in the 1950s. You know, you certainly had like the EC horror comics and, and more B movies and things like that. I, I'm just, I mean, I'm not sure. I'm just saying that completely off the cuff. So I think that the notion of, of something being a supernatural story or, or just, you know, calling it a ghost story for a long time, people would refer to stories that are not actually ghost stories as ghost stories because they did not have other terms. It was like an easy catch all to, to describe them. Yeah, no, no, totally. I mean, I, I think, you know, at heart, for me, a ghost story is a detective story, you know, and, and that's kind of all the podcasts I've made have been very much based on on that theory really that you know uh, that if you're a skeptic it's a how done it about trying to make sense of it you know dr montague talks about is it underground streams and things like that you know and, and if you're a believer it's a who done it and we get that so much here with the the story of ukraine and the girls but i think you know i think you know as humans we love detective stories don't we Ida? you know we we we, we you know we we revel in a mystery essentially this this is a, a great detective story as well as being a, a scary story we, we revel in the mystery, and I think there's also a comfort. I mean, I'm, I'm very interested in the level of comfort that they can bring, mm. you know, because the the who done it presupposes that somebody did do it, and we will find out. <laughs> so it's kind of, it's so unlike um, the rest of life <laughs> where stuff, you know, you can start this thing is set running. The you know, there's a kind of extraordinary satisfaction in it. Um, and that's, you know, th there's a, um, yeah, there's a, I, I was just going to, I was just thinking sort of so slightly of what, while, while you were talking, and there's a moment, um, I'm trying to remember the exact quote so that, so there's, the, there's that side of it, but there's also, there's a, there's, there's a, there's a very, there's a phrase in the haunting of Hill House, something about the sort of loss of religion, um, and, and, and not having, and not having the superstitions to um, 
So it's something about sort of fear and 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 then not not having the superstitions to keep the fear in its place, which mm. I think is really interesting. There's a kind of bit where where he talks about kind of why we believe in ghosts. Um, yeah. Is that, is that, could, the, the bit, I mean, I, I was looking back at a bit where he talks about, yes, I think, the, the, tell me if it's this bit here. He says, um, uh, here we go. The, um, one cannot even say the ghost attacks the mind because the mind, the conscious thinking mind is invulnerable. In all our conscious minds, as we sit here talking, there is not one iota of belief in ghosts. Not one of us, <laughs> even after last night, can say the word ghost without a little involuntary smile. No, the menace of the supernatural is that it attacks where modern minds are weakest, where we have abandoned our protective armour of superstition and have no substitute defence. Not one of us thinks rationally that what ran through the garden last night was a ghost and what knocked on the door was a ghost. And yet there was certainly something going on in Hill House last night, and the mind's instinctive refuge, self-doubt, is eliminated. We cannot say it was my imagination because three other people were there too. Yeah, yeah that's it. <laughs> there we go. And I, I just knew that from ESP. That's how I was able to put it. No, I, I'd written down the back of my book uh, when I was reading it, like 140, page 140, Human Belief in Ghosts. That's a good bit. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, no, I mean, absolutely. I mean, you know, we could we could wax lyrical um, all all night about kind of why we believe in ghosts and the, the kind of I think she gets into all sorts of the kind of um, you know evolutionary psychology moments why we're, why we're scared and why we believe in these things. Um, I've got a question for you though that is is a very different kind of question that comes from Ewan, uh, and he says, if you had the chance and had your safety guaranteed, would you want to experience a night in Hill House? Liz, would you would you spend the night? You almost did in writing your book. You spent months in Hill House. Um, yeah, I kind of feel question? like I did, but um, yeah, that's a great question, you and I. I um, yeah, I would probably do it if my safety. I would I would want to have my safety guaranteed, <laughs> um, <laughs> but I felt like you know I I got through it once. Um, so unless I'd be pushing my luck doing it again. Yeah, I think I would do it. I'd be very, uh, I think my curiosity would win out. And as you were, that, that section that you were just reading, which I, which I was talking about, I think, you know, our, whatever we experience, our conscious minds, our rational minds reject it. And so I think going into it, you think, yeah, I'll do this. Nothing's going to happen. Um, and then, you know, ideally the next day, even if something did happen, <laughs> you'd be able to you might not say oh that didn't happen but you you would be able to say all right good i lived through that <laughs> I, I i don't i don't how, how do you feel about a night in hill house i think there are some crucial details i'd want to know <laughs> like who was there with me <laughs> <laughs> would you want a full risk assessment before going in there <laughs> uh, we could go I, together I, I, no we could all go together absolutely Let, let's <laughs> Let's let's arrange it. But um, no, I I think I I I would be quite nervous. I I do think there's a kind of there's a, there's you know you know how the best um a lot of the best horror I think plays on that fear of transgression of it being our fault. You know the, the the ring, for instance. You know you put the videotape in, and then you know it it leads to your death. You know that idea of kind of opening the Pandora's box you know like when you do the ouija board and then you bring it upon yourself you know we can kind of cope with it being somebody else's fault but when it's our fault that's uh you know that's too much and i think you know that the, the book's got that quality hasn't it that you know that they they shouldn't have come here you know and and you know they, they realize slowly over time that it's been a real mistake to come here and and and, and nell only really realizes what a big mistake in that kind of last line of the book you know I, and eleanor seems you know everybody else I think our sympathies, at least my sympathies, are, are always very much with Eleanor because she's just so excited and so expectant after her, you know, her the years of caring for her mother and, and everything else. She's setting out. At last, she's going to get her cup of stars, you know. She's going to have this wonderful adventure and she's going to make friends. And 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 it's just, it's really heartbreaking, Um when it doesn't go as she had hoped, you know, I think she's really the one who goes in there just very open hearted. Um, and which I think was deliberate, you know, in, in the way that Jackson created her. Um, so it's, it's, it's very poignant. I find uh, what happens to her throughout the book. 
No, t- totally, totally. Um, we've got another question from Sim, um, who says, some people say that Shirley Jackson wrote this book to share how she felt trapped in her marriage and home life. Could you talk a little bit more about this? Um, uh, I mean, it, it le- leads me to a thought like I had, I, I remember talking to a, a Hollywood producer one time who said to me that when you're writing anything, you've got to think about what's it about and what's it really about. So my my question to both of you, first, just for Shirley Jackson, Liz, you know, what what, what what's this book really about? What, what What's bubbling under here? What's going on that, that is kind of under the surface here? Well, I, I can't speak for her. Um, you know, certainly her children, uh, very happy and you know their memories of both of their parents and and uh their childhoods um you know uh are happy ones at least what what i've read and heard but i having said that i think shirley jackson whatever went on with in, with her um you know relationship and, and marriage to stanley i think that um you know she was a very very intelligent woman who was living in an era that was not uh, very, you know, open to women who are intelligent and ambitious. Um, she had four children. She was, she kind of, you know, invented this whole notion of like a, you know, a mommy blog, a, a domestic blog with Life Among the Savages and its sequel. I mean, she was writing these very, very funny, very personal short articles uh, from McCall's and the Ladies Home Journal and other other magazines uh, before or, you know, in tandem with the other books she was writing. And they and they were drawn on her life and her experience with her kids and her husband and her life. And they're they're really funny. That was the first thing of hers I ever read was one of those stories when I was about seven or eight years old. And I thought it was hilarious. I still do. But so she was, um, you know, she was a professional woman and a very ambitious writer and a really busy writer. You know, as I, I don't, you know, I'm, I think you've read the letters and the and the biography. You know, she's really Jackson really worked very very hard, and um, whatever went on, you know, and North Bennington, Vermont, is a very small town. <laughs> so moving there and and having you know that exp- you know having a change in her life experienced, um, I think that that. Uh, I think that that had, you know, almost certainly had an impact. I mean, reading the lottery, it's hard to believe it didn't, you know, but, but she also had a very, she had a difficult relationship with her own mother in, in many ways and, um, you know, loving, but uh, occasionally challenging. So, um, you know, I think she, she was very much a woman of her time and the emphasis being a woman. She was somebody who, really chafed at a lot of the constraints and restraints that women in the 1950s and early 1960s lived under and lived with. Do you feel there are elements of her and Nell then? You were mentioning about the relationship with the mother. Are there, are there bits of Nell that you recognise from things you've heard from her family about her? Her, her fa- Not never from her family I, 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 at all. I think, um, you know, what I what I would surmise would be probably what any reader would, would surmise is just, you know, from reading the book and having some, you know, basic, uh, not really deep. um, I'm not a scholar of of Jackson's work and there are many, there are many people out there who are. Um, But I think, you know, one can read, yes, that some of the, um, I think Eleanor's relationship with her mother was much more extreme um, than, than Shirley Jackson's was with hers. So, uh, but, you know, I think for writers, fiction writers, and maybe, and, you know, nonfiction writers as well, I think there are elements of our real lives that bleed into our work, that seep into our work, whether we, whether we're conscious of of it or not, whether we're deliberately doing that or not. Um, So I think it's inevitable that there are probably, you know, elements of Jackson's life that are in there, but I would not you know, be able to go through it and, and point and say, here, 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 here. Sure, here. sure, sure. Um, Ida, the, the same question, but kind of from a reader's perspective, that, that idea of, you know, if it's about a visit to a haunted house, what, what is it really about? I think it's it's a, a book that people project onto 
a lot, isn't it? You know, sort of seeing underlying themes and, and things bubbling under. What, what, what do you feel it's really about? Uh, that, um, I don't know if I want to boil it down that much, but I am, I have been, I was thinking as, as Liz was speaking about how that, that thing about being a busy professional woman with four children and a big house and a lot of pets. I think there was one point like seven. Yeah. Um, and on, on, on the edge of a sort of academic, you know, her husband was a professor. He went out into the world, but she had this sort of, um, and I think, you know, reading the biography and, uh, and, and stuff like that, I feel that there was a sort of big tension between, you know, a lot of that, there's a lot of caring going on. And caring is a really big thing in the haunting of Hill House. It's a sort of the, those 11 years of care. She, you know, and there's a, and for her, like, even if she doesn't, you know, I mean, even if she is, is if she's caring for four children, caring for her husband, caring for pets, caring for, um, and the tension between writing, which is an incredibly selfish, very, focused internal thing and the dissolution of self which is what caring can bring about I think is a really interesting thing to look at as because because that is a you know that is a very strong theme in in the novel which is you know the sort of caring I mean I there's a there's a moment where she's you know she's finished with her mom she's finished with her sister she arrives at the house and there's a moment I think it's on their first evening where she's literally kind of listing herself into being. She's kind of like, I'm a person who doesn't like lobster. I'm a person who, you know, I don't know, has red shoes or whatever. You know, she's she's gathering up the pieces of herself into a story of a woman who is whole. And I think that that actually is part of the great power of this, which is that, you know, that then it, and then and then obviously it blows apart because other people are not participating in this hole that she's building and not helping her because actually she depends on them as being part, you know, I have friends, here are my friends. This is also my new, you know, this is also this self that I'm building. Um, I'm sort of fascinated in that, you know, with that. Yeah, no, it's it's really interesting. I mean, they they all they play that game of all having imaginative lives when they first meet, don't they? Like Luke describes himself as a bullfighter, and Theodora is a princess, and <laughs> uh, you know. But but w w the problem for Eleanor is that all the others have a real life, and she doesn't. You know, she she there is there's nothing that she can, you know, no substance she can actually go back to. Um, we've got about seven minutes left, so I want to get try and get through a few audience questions, if that's okay. Um, one thing uh from isaac he says for readers who have enjoyed this book what else would you recommend so um yeah it, it, what what would you recommend uh liz for a, a halloween night such as this for people who've enjoyed mm. the haunting of hill house um uh, you've, you've already mentioned quite a few of shirley's other works i think people will hopefully go and you know dig out some of those uh you know which obviously are not all uh, supernatural based at all but you know it, within this kind of same genre what would you recommend well we have always lived in the castle which i mentioned earlier um i would say tanana reeve dues the reformatory is a, a brilliant novel that is uh, a ghost story among many 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 other things that's a fabulous book um the most frightening book that i think i have read in the last 10 or so years the, the book that actually literally I was reading it and I put it down. I was alone and, and, and I could not, I did not want to turn the light off uh, to go to sleep was um, Dan Sean's Ill Will. Sean spelled C-H-A-O-N. Uh, he's a brilliant American writer, writes really amazing, uh, very unsettling novels. And I would call this book more supernatural adjacent, maybe than uh, overtly supernatural natural but it's backgrounded into the satanic witch scares of the 80s and in the present day a serial killer and um i loved what you said ida about the dissolution of self and caring because the one of the protagonists the main protagonist is a man who um whose wife died several years earlier of cancer and he raised his two sons who are now young adults on their his own and anyway it's a really scary book it, it's and it and it does have a haunted house in it as you get through it. It has a place, a um, 
a funeral, an abandoned funeral home, which I think is called Willis, the Willis Funeral Home, and some of the climactic and the most terrifying part scenes in the book take place in there. So, you know, I would say if you like, uh, if you like haunted house books, this is certainly a, a you know, I think would would fit with you know under that rubric, um, but a very you know contemporary it came out in twenty sixteen you know, a 21st century take on it. That's great. I, I, Ida, what about you? Are, you? are you a reader of ghost stories in general? I have to say that I'm not. <laughs> so so uh, I, I can't, I, I'm just like racking my brain to like... Well, don't worry, long. just give it, give us give us a recommendation of, um, you know, it, I mean, you've obviously enjoyed Shirley Jackson and, and this this book. Give, give us a, a, a recommendation for something else you think our audience would enjoy. Do you know the thing that's strange? It's so unrelated in some ways, but like, is um, I really Dorothy Sayers with the who who done it aspect. She had the re and I think maybe the reason I'm thinking of her is is that kind of thing of it's it's a who done it's, it's a detective story. Like you know, there's a whole series of detective stories. There's, you know, there's, there's you know nine tales. That's actually quite eerie. Um, um and um Gordy Knight but she also has this very interesting thing where it's a detective story and therefore it's genre but actually I you know I had lost track within the first I don't know 100 pages of who did what to whom and why and I wasn't that bothered about it because the writing was so brilliant and it was it, it, it was that thing of the sort of so the the the, the eye and the humor and the wryness and so the, I mean you know I did care about what happened in the end. Kind of it was like you know it's real literature which with this sort of engine of you know, of fear or who did it or you know so I would. I can... That's great. That's a great recommendation. I, I, I personally, I would recommend um, uh, Michelle Paver. I never know if it's Paver or Paver. P A V E R, um, who uh, wrote a brilliant book called Thin Air, which is a ghost story set on a climbing expedition into the Himalayas, which I, I think is is wonderful. She's written a few ghost story novels, so that that would be one of my. Halloween recommendations, and obviously we're all too modest to recommend our own books, but we've all got we've all got books out. Which uh, you know, if if you uh, if you liked us talking to you at all tonight, you might want to go and seek out. But um, uh, let's just have a look. We've got about two minutes left. Um, do, 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 do. Oh yes, um, uh, I'm going to ask you. This is from Max, not related to the book directly, but can you each please give us your top writing tip? So that this might be our last question. So just a, a top writing tip <laughs> from each of you, if that's okay. <laughs> oh, my. Um, I would say just to, which is very hard to do, to, to, try to try to do some writing every day, even if it's just a little bit, but also just to read. Read mm -hmm. widely. Read as much as you can. Yeah, I, I would say that's the main thing. Read a lot. I think that's great advice. I mean, I always say that as well. If somebody says to me, like, I'm interested in making podcasts or writing plays, or whatever, I always say, like, you know, just go and listen to lots of podcasts, watch lots of plays, whatever you're doing. It, but you know, soak up a lot of stuff and get to know what you like and what you don't like. Um, Ida, what would you say? Um, uh, I mean, if I did writing every day is 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 is, is the ideal, but like, just actually do it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, comes down to it you can think of all sorts of brilliant stuff but you actually sort of you know and 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 what you initially do might be terrible but you have to keep doing it and then you know and then you can always come back and fix it but it needs to happen i think that's very true i think i think appreciating it is a part of a process i mean i think woody allen said that 90 percent of writing is rewriting and it's so true you know you get something down you avoid that ter terrifying fear of the blank page and then you know it, it's it's about working and reworking it i mean I, I know it took me five years to write my play and and it was you know this kind of crazy labor of love going back and forth over it i i do think writing something that that feels personal to you writing something that you you um you, that you know about, care about, and and want to read about. And I, I think you know audiences 
uh, really react to that. I think, you know, whether it's a book or a podcast or a film, or whatever, I think, you know, that kind of, you know, we, it, we, we smell inauthenticity. I think, you know, if you, if you mm. love this thing and, and, and desperately want to write about it, then I think pe people will appreciate that and, and it'll shine through the page. Um, I, I said I was going to start this session by reading the beginning of the haunting of the house and I forgot, which is very poor <laughs> hosting. Uh, so I'm going to I'm going to finish it by reading the end of Hill House instead. Um, before I do that, thank you so much to both of you, uh, Liz and Ida. It's been brilliant. You, you're absolutely fascinating. You know, it's one of those books we could probably talk about all night. And, uh, you know, we could um, sort of take people back to our virtual pub and, and stay up till midnight <laughs> chatting about this book or even go to Hill House together. But um, we, we can't do that. But thank you so much. It's been it's been a joy. And I hope people have really appreciated it. Thank you to everybody who's been watching as well and for all those great questions from everybody. But this is the end of The Haunting of Hill House to take us off onto this Halloween night into the darkness. Hill House itself, not sane, stood against its hills, holding darkness within. It had stood so for 80 years and might stand for 80 more. Within its walls, continue, within its walls continued upright. Bricks met neatly, floors were firm, and doors were sensibly shut. Silence lay steadily against the wood and stone of Hill House, and whatever walked there, walked alone. I felt a shiver down my spine just reading that. I there. got goosebumps. Um, oh, oh dear. Thank you so much. What, what a book. Uh, go out and and, um, and uh, tell your friends to read it if they haven't. Um, thank you for joining us, everybody. And we will, um, uh, the, the Hay Book Club, not us, but the Hay Book Club will be back next uh, month with another book. <laughs>